Whoa. Well, Dunch. Hello there. <laughs> dun dun, dear friends. <laughs> Yo, you good people, friends, lovers. Thank you for joining us. It's it's Sunday. It's six o'clock Eastern, or whenever it is, wherever you are. It's time. It's time for five minutes. Five minutes with Robert and Amy Nacer and you. On your mark, get set. Five minutes. And you know who you are. And if you don't, you'll know by the end of this episode. It's the episode of identity. You nice guys out there. You nice gals out there. You know, I came across one thing after another this week. Reinforcing the idea, well, you know, nice guys finish last. And we'll talk about that. But first, today is April 21st, Sunday, the 21st. What are we at? 112th day of the year. We have gotten into halfway through the fourth month. A little more than half. And it's National Tea Day. Yes, it's not my usual cup of coffee. A cup of tea custom made by Amy. Thank you for that. <laughs> you put the ingredients and I stirred. <laughs> we will talk about National Tea. Why would it be National Tea Day? I don't know, but I do know it's mm. the birthday of the late, but great, Queen Elizabeth. Was mm. she just, I'm not about monarchy, but was she the best? Not really, but I mean, she was as best as she could be, I think. Thing. For a monarch. <laughs> For a monarch, she was about as good as it gets. But first, 112th day of the year, uh, 254 days left. If you had a chart, it would look like a lot of days, 254. I've done this before with graph paper. Make a grid of your days, make a grid of your years. Know what you got, what you got time-wise ahead of you. But 254 isn't really that much. So I hope your dear, your year is really off to a good start uh, Christmas is in 248 days, in case you haven't started your Christmas shopping yet. And on this date, April 21st, 1885. Wait, wait, Halloween? How about Halloween? <laughs> okay. What? 193 <laughs> days until Halloween. Wow, that that's like a, a couple of uh, misdemeanor sentences. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every year you got to add more to your Halloween decorations. So catch them in the off season. Sometimes you can get some really cool stuff. You can get that 18 foot uh, skeleton. God, I hate those. I hate that people keep them up year round. But I love it. I know you do. You, you can tell which one of us is the ho fan of Halloween and why one of us always talks about the days till Christmas. Okay, April 21st. What happened? What the heck happened in 1895? So what would that be? 128 years ago, the first movie projector was demonstrated in the United States. Now, I had often thought that Thomas Edison invented the movie projector. Well, he invented uh, the movie machine. But mm -hmm. at this time, it was um, the little machines you looked down into, like, like peep shows. That has a different right, sense right. now. But, you know, the, the, the Nickelodeon, yeah. the, you put a coin in the box and you watch a 30-second long move. Well, before there were ever movies, 30 seconds? That was so cool. But on this date, yes, uh, Woodville Latham and his sons, Otway and Gray, demonstrated their panopticon. The first movie projector developed in the United States. Uh, there's a whole history leading up to this. It's great. They had the magic lanterns. Magic lanterns as far back as the 1600s. And what's neat about that, if you've been to Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, yes, the home of the Henry Ford. You know, Dearborn comes up a lot lately in the news, but not because of the greatness that is the Henry Ford. And so I'm going to keep hammering it. I don't care that it's also the Arabic capital of the United States. It does, that doesn't mean anything. Well, with a name like Nasser, I got no problem with that. But what really matters about Dearborn is that's where the Henry Ford is. That's where Greenfield Village is. If you click the link which in the show notes about most, the Magic Lantern, you will see a link to thing. the Henry Ford. And there are nice uh, Arabs and Muslims uh, in Dearborn. Most of the people um, there are just normal. They're, they're just they're, people. <laughs> yeah. they're just like a, and they're not really interested in yelling things like, 
death to America. No, they're not no, into they're that. they're just not into it. You could mistake them for human beings, <laughs> for people like us. You could make that mistake. The magic lantern. The magic lantern. It was, if you don't already know, and you haven't been to Greenfield Village and seen it in action, it was essentially like a slide projector that ran on candles or oil lamps. And it yes. had a lens, and you could light it and put a slide. And it was often... Uh, so the slides, they didn't have photographs. They were painted on glass, hand-painted mm -hmm. slides. Put them in the machine, and they would shine on the wall. Yes. Yeah, not super bright because you were dealing with oil lamps or candles. But the point is you had the magic lantern as far back as the 1600s. Projector. Well, as far back as the, where am I in, in my notes here? Here we go. Yeah, as far back as the 1700s, you had people playing with the idea of multiple cards to make motion. If you've ever done the flip books, oh, these were fun when we were in high school. You would take a, a stack of paper or make a little book or yeah. do this with the edge of a real book and you would draw a stick figure or a cartoon on it and then you flip the page and you can kind of see where you did the previous page by the indentations and you would draw the same picture but a little bit different and then do it on the next page and a little bit different and you flip the pages and you've made a movie. So they had this, but they couldn't project it on a wall. So you have the magic lantern that can project a slide on a wall. You've got flip books and then eventually the kinescopes and the, the different ways of doing sort of motion through. And then Edison, of course, mastered that. But yeah, it was on this date, 1895, that they got combined the, these motion pictures and projectors. And I'm loving the history of it. I, love, I of course, find it ironic that it was called the Panopticon. When yeah, I, go ahead with your story. <laughs> well, when I, when I say panopticon, tell me in the chat. It's good to see everybody is in the chat, mm -hmm. especially my favorite people. Uh, our our, our, our steadfast, stead, what's the word I'm looking for? The good people who our are often here. Kindreds? Yes, our kindred spirits. Yes. Well, a lot of you being philosophical types will hear the word panopticon and think, Jeremy Bentham, isn't that the prison that Jeremy Bentham designed? And the answer is yes, he called it the Panopticon, where you had a prison and all the cells, the, oh, the front of the cell faced a center circle, like spokes on a bicycle wheel. And the idea was that you could have a watchman, a guard, a prison guy in the center of the Panopticon, and he could always see what's going on in the cells of the prisoners. Uh, Jeremy Bentham thought this would be a great idea because one of the problems in a prison is you leave people alone too long. You know, ne'er-do-wells, real, real problem people. And there's all sorts of mischief. They can do themselves harm. If you have more than one person in a cell, they can do each other harm. They could be trying to slowly scrape through the walls or break out the bars in the windows trying to escape. So you develop this panopticon. This was actually tried. There are links to the uh, panopticon that they tried in Great Britain. Eventually, that prison was replaced, but it was out there. Well, nowadays, when we say panopticon, what do you think of? Well, if you are conspiracy-minded at all, or if you're surrounded by conspiracy types like some of us have been, you know. You know, we all live in that prison. We live in the panopticon. <laughs> We've been observed by our government, well, since the CIA, since the early 1900s, but especially in the age of technology. Have you got an Amazon Echo anywhere in your house? Or a Google Nest? Or not the Nest. What's their uh, their, their Google whatever they call it. Google Home mm -hmm. devices in your home. Have you even got an iPhone? You never know what you know, Siri is going to say if you accidentally say her name the wrong way. So we live in the panopticon. We know the government can hear it all. And, it, and we, we're also, we have 24-hour access to really bad jokes. Oh, yes. That, that's yeah. practically the end of the world right there. Alexa, tell us a joke. Why do raccoons eat out of trash cans? Because they can't tip over a supermarket. That was, that was not the worst. Usually the, the jokes we get from the Amazon <laughs> Echo device are the that. worst jokes. Why do raccoons eat out of trash cans? Because they can't tip over a supermarket. You know, it's got the elements of a joke. There's actually a twist there. So that was that was not as bad. That didn't stink as bad as normal. Uh, yeah. yeah, so Christopher Smith says we're all Google Home. Yeah, uh, 
uh, some of our best friends actually use Android devices. It's so weird. No, I mean, uh, that's cool. And hey, I know people who use the, the Siri, the, the app, Apple version, and we don't do that. We are iPhone users, but our home yeah. devices are all uh, Amazon. But as Robert and I were discussing before, that oftentimes um, yeah. surveillance is often contractual. So if you do sign That's up true. for devices and things like that and have a smartphone and everything, uh, yes, um, you will be observed by many marketers, <laughs> myself included. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an overlord and every, everyone, I, I work in marketing, so I'm an overlord. It's a tough um, one because I don't know if anybody on earth <laughs> has ever actually read the fine print so what did you actually agree to? And it's funny that we... But, but, but if you really wanted to, you could you know, go off the grid. Go get yourself a tiny house. You and know. Many people do. Yeah. We, have, we have friends who refuse to use certain devices or certain services, and that's cool. You decide what your risk tolerance is for privacy challenges. But that doesn't really fix it. Uh, I was listening to a podcast where somebody was telling the story about um, the cameras that are out there now everywhere, and not just traffic cameras, but any security cameras that are connected to the internet, they can, they, you know, the CIA or the deeper levels Me. of the security <laughs> in the United States, if you're out in the street, they know where you are. They can do that. The story sounded a little bit exaggerated, but at the same time, it was a professional who knew what he, Bottom line is, your privacy is somewhat limited. Yes, we do live in a version of the Panopticon that Jerry B. Bentham thought was such a good idea, that, that crazy prison where you could watch everybody all the time. One of the tricks of the Panopticon, and this is what I rely on, the trick of the, and Jeremy Bentham talked about this, you know, going way, way back. Um, he knew that you couldn't actually watch everybody all the time. Because that would essentially take one person to watch each one individual. No, you've got one guy, and the reason it works isn't that they're actually being watched, but that you don't know when you're being watched. And that is it, what we call in the computer business, and maybe in the world at large, security through obscurity. And that's what I'm relying on. I didn't mean to get too much into that. I just wanted to point out that, yeah, the Panopticon was also the name of the first motion picture projector. Not motion pictures in general. Again, Edison perfected that early, and he also perfected the projector. Um, but yes, it was the Panopticon. The Panopticon was also a British uh, music hall. So it's funny that the word carries so much. Like the word Leviathan, you know, these words that carry so much weight now. The Panopticon was also the British Panopticon. Uh, so cool stuff. Links in the show notes if you have any curiosity about that, and you should. What's going on in our chat? Christopher says it's called pork chop decor. The pork chop decor. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I have no it's idea. It sounds cool, delicious. Pretty cool word, especially with some maybe some baked apples with cinnamon and some nice broccoli, yeah. fresh broccoli with a little butter. Apollo um, Zeus is talking. I talked about security through obscurity. He's talking about paranoia through uncertainty. <laughs> I think by the time we're done talking tonight, you will say yes, that's an option, <laughs> but it's only. An option, and you don't have to choose it. So, happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday to James Newell Osterberg. Oh, <laughs> we're getting into that now. Yes. I, I wanted to mention... Do you have more to say about the Panopticon and security? And Paul, Paul mentioned in the chat that... Yes. Uh, pe quote, people who have nothing to hide have nothing to fear. Pe I, love, um, I actually love that quote because it's horrible. It's terrible. And it's horrible in multiple ways. And I always love so a quote many. that's horrible in multiple ways. People who, who do nothing... If you don't do anything wrong... Well, you know, that's why we have a judicial system, um, because, you know, if you do, if, say, for instance, all of a sudden you find so, uh, find a dead body, well, you're the first to find that person, maybe you're the last person who saw that person alive. Um, but there's all sorts of ways that um, timelines and facts and things like that that detectives have to work with to untangle the truth, and uh, it may not actually work. So you're, you, have, you have due process. Um, so, I mean, if, if you do everything, uh, you know, completely according to law, you still might be accused of murder someday. <laughs> right. So anyway, better just to avoid point. the whole thing altogether. And that, that's why you should never, ever talk to the police and always, even if you are innocent, even if you know something, always demand a lawyer. Uh, another area in which Amy and I are somewhat different. I 
I like but, police. I think police are the best. Well, and, and I do really want to talk to them. Cause they you got to protect yourself. And of course, I got to protect myself. That's why I need police. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the, it's the exception to the rule that you've got a bad cop or a bad detective or incompetent person. But you know, still. Mark Twain famously said, "If you if you if you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything." Mm-hmm. You know, meaning remember what it was that you told each particular person. Yes. And it goes with that idea of if you never do anything wrong, you don't need to worry about privacy or anything else. Well, obviously that's wrong, and that's part of what makes it funny. There are things you don't want people to know or be exposed to, even though there's nothing wrong with them. And so we're going to talk about our sex lives. I mean... <laughs> what? I mean, we're going to talk about, for example, what you might expose children to and what you shouldn't expose children to, even if there's nothing wrong with it. But meanwhile, yes, happy birthday to Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop, yes. What's his real name again? James something James Osterberg? Newell Osterberg. Newell. Yes. Newell, yeah, he is Newell. from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So from Ann Arbor, is, right down the street from the studio. The godfather of punk rock. The godfather of punk rock. And, oh, uh, was, they, they call him proto-punk, but really... Yeah. And you know, along with the MC5 yes. and uh, and those Vi- make, um, makeup guys, who were they again? Uh, they're not Queens of New York, but it's uh, the, um, oh, New York Dolls. New York Dolls, right? And uh, Velvet Underground. Velvet Underground. Yes. And uh, and Laura Nairo was part of that group too. So yes, yes, Iggy Pop is seventy-seven years old today, and the great thing about Iggy, well, there's several great things about Iggy Pop. It's amazing that he outlasted David Bowie. That's so sad. <sighs> Because they did work together. Yeah, you know, they, right. He actually recorded China Girl before Bowie did his version. They wrote mm-hmm. it together. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Iggy is still out there. 77 years old and still rock and rolling. Still willing to take off his shirt. Yeah, good for him. Um, last time I saw him live, <laughs> he didn't take off his shirt for the whole show. But yeah, he took his shirt off. And he looks like he's in his 70s. But that's not going to stop him from rocking out. He's got more attitude than I've ever had, even when I was a youngster. Right. Too cool. When he was young, he would roll around on the stage with his shirt off. There would sometimes be broken glass on the floor. He's got the scars from that. The point is, you couldn't stop Iggy. No. Iggy Pop was going to do what Iggy Pop was going to do, and nothing was going to stop him. A force of nature. A force of nature. Yes. And a force of music. Now, arguably, an even greater force of music, if not quite as daring, is Robert Smith. I love Robert Smith, by the way. Robert Smith is, you know, one of our themes today is you got to you got to define yourself and then live that. You got to decide what you want to be and then have the strength and the guts, the balls to do it. Robert Smith decided what the cure was going to be, and he made this this thing, this band, and this style of music, and Rob- he's still doing it. And Robert would disagree with me, but I think Robert Smith is absolutely dreamy. Now, Robert Robert Smith. Just physically, and Robert Smith today is 65 years old. You know, he's he's got so a little doughy, but he's 12 years younger than Iggy Pop, and no, I'm not going to beat up Robert Smith. I'm just, I'm just going to say he hasn't aged as well as Robert Smith as as no, Iggy Pop has. No, he hasn't. He, he, he ha- needs a little help. But it hasn't stopped him from going out in the full makeup and lipstick and all the things that he did when he was young and cute. Rex, I don't know how cute he ever really was. Oh my was, God, but, he was, oh. But. Too much. He had his thing, and his his too thing much. was powerful. When he was young. When he was young. <laughs> and he still puts on I, the show. I swear, there are some men, they when they wear that lipstick, and they wear they wear that uh, makeup, ah. oh my God. Okay. I, <laughs> cool. So happy birthday. Happy birthday to Iggy Pop, to Robert Smith. We honor these particular musicians because that was my mood today. It's only about the musicians. And there weren't too many other important birthdays today other than the former queen, the late queen. You know, sometimes you you, you measure somebody by comparison to what the alternatives were. Um, yeah. For example... The last two presidents we've had don't look as bad if you can consider them compared to other American presidents. If you consider them compared to decent men, yeah, they they, yeah. they look they're ethically they look like <laughs> Robert Smith looks physically. But oh no, <laughs> take it back. But if you compare them, then they're just horrible. But only just horrible compared to. Barack Obama or George Bush or Bill Clinton, it could be, you know, worse. Nothing can ever touch the greatness of Robert Smith. Now, if you compare 
you know, and pick your poison. You know, we loathe and despise everything about both Joe Biden and Donald Trump. If you compare them, we don't get into politics here. What am I even talking about? You compare them to Ronald Reagan, they seem worse. If you compare them to George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, they look like something you'd scrape off the bottom of your shoe, except you wouldn't, you'd just throw those shoes away. So I didn't mean to get into that. That's exactly where I'm going to leave that. The only reason it came back up for me is because it's kind of sad that it's the Queen's birthday, but it is National Tea Day. So I'm going to have a sip of my tea that Amy made me. Yeah, and uh, to to John, uh, John the Corrector is in the chat. Hey, John, how are you doing? Very cool. Um, and what's I am. Aunt, his question is: uh, Is there a female star you'd like to gush over? Female stars I'd like to gush over. Yeah, I would. I would say probably Corin Tucker or Sleater Kinney. Could be. Could be. Could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's she's balls to the wall. She's got more testosterone than most of the men I've known, and she wears it well. She's yeah. just super cool. Yeah, she is. I, yeah, I was a big Slater Kinney fan. The last few years after they lost the world's greatest drummer, uh, Janet Weiss, oh they haven't that, followed she, them Janet as didn't, much. Did, Janet didn't die. She no, went she didn't to die. She, <laughs> she went to something else. So. No, no, Slater Kinney, for folks who don't know, Slater Kinney is an indie punk band. Uh, part of the Riot Girl movement, although they were more independent than what was going on there. Um uh, centered around two women, Corin Tucker and Carrie Brownstein. Yes, the same Carrie Brownstein that was the star of Portlandia and yeah. other things. And th- after their first couple of albums, they brought on a drummer named Janet Weiss, who is is a force to be reckoned with and took them from being, you know, kind of a clever, noisy, indie punk band to being, well, I think the New York Times at the time described them as the greatest rock band nobody knows about. And uh, the greatest rock band you've never heard of. And it was a good description. Um, no, I don't know if I gush over Corin Tucker, though. And how about, how about Ritzy Bryan of Joy Formidable? She was more of a gush over kind of musician, oh. yeah. Oh. Yeah, a little more. I could see that. Nice. Um, when he said female star, I didn't, I, actually, I didn't think of musical stars. I thought of, like, movie stars. Oh, right. Yeah, no, female movie stars that I would gush over. I don't know. I... Mm, you know, sitting next to the misses, the names just don't <laughs> pop up for me. Because I see, you know, they're beautiful yeah, women I, in movies. And then I look at Amy and I think, oh, yeah, yeah, those movie stars are second best. So, you know, I, yeah, I got to say, I mean, there, there are female stars. I wouldn't gush over them, but I admire them greatly. Um, but I don't know, male movie stars nowadays, I am, there's just, it's a desert. I don't know. I don't find any male movie stars currently right now, like, even remotely attractive. And it, it, <laughs> I just, yeah. just don't have it. I'm not, a po- have it. <laughs> I'm not a posters on the wall kind of guy. So when I gush over a female movie star, it's because of the movie, because of the role. Right. And part of it is, I'm sure, what the actress brought to it. It wouldn't be the same. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then it becomes Juliette Binoche or um, Audrey Tattoo. You like but, Julie but, Roberts. You like Julie Roberts. Well, in some films. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's obviously an actress has to bring it to the film, and it's got to be something that was in them. Right. Um, you don't get to make a film like um, Pretty Woman if you don't have something in you. Because it's the premise of the film isn't that great. It's a hooker with a heart of gold kind of movie. Um, but because of what Richard Gere and Julia Roberts do in that film, it's one of my all-time favorite movies. And uh, always recommend that to anybody who hasn't seen it yet. But the premise, you know, Hooker with a Heart of Gold gets the rich guy to re- reconsider the way he's living his life. It's a little too obvious and, and, and fantasy, fairy tale-ish. But they play that for what it actually is. Mm. You know, they don't try to make it anything other than what it is. And then do it perfectly. Yeah. It's just perfect for what it is. So, yes, yes, Julia Roberts depends on the... Again, for, for every female actress, if I'm going to swoon, it's because of the role. It's because of what they did. I don't have a poster of Farrah Fawcett on my bedroom door or <laughs> any of that. And never did. I was never a, a posters on the wall kind of guy, even though I've had my crushes. But they often last for the duration of the film. Mm, yeah. The only well crush that there, really darling. lasts is for my wife. Oh, who's that? She's super hot. <laughs> Do I know her? Well, 
You know her well. <laughs> and if you don't know her well, I will help you with that. So, uh, I, I only have one item under shameless self-promotion. And what are we listening to this week? First of all, I don't have any self-promotion going on other than you should like the show if you're watching on YouTube. And share it if you've got the stones to do that. I know, I know a lot of you worry about what will other people think if I share this show and maybe they're not impressed. But if you've got the balls, yeah, you should share this show. You show us cojones, you've got them. When I if, look if at the you number, have that, that uh, Amazonian uh, fiery woman strength. Damn straight. <laughs> and you can share it on your platform of, <laughs> platform of choice. We're working on YouTube numbers right now. But if you're you know listening to the Apple Podcast, however you're taking the show in, Facebook Live, all day. Oh, I don't actually have Facebook Live up. I have been uh, neglectful here. So mm, say I'm something. In there. I'm say in there. something while I bring that up. Yeah. Hello, uh, Narendra Petia. Jim is also there oh, um, man. as well. I can't believe that. How did I not? I always have both of the chats up so that I. Uh, well, can I've it, got you covered. Can so, at least uh, see the comments, even if I don't get to say something to everybody. Here yeah, we go. Yeah, I dare everybody right now to go ahead and like the show on YouTube. I dare you. <laughs> dare I, you? I bet you. I bet you're too chicken. <laughs> well, Y'all chicken. Buck, 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 buck. That's harsh. <laughs> Damn. And it, I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Prove me wrong. Prove, Prove us me wrong. wrong. <laughs> Stick it to me. Is that is that strategy just a little too obvious? <laughs> Stick it to the marketer. It's kind of like you know going up to somebody and say, "I'll bet you're too chicken to give me twenty dollars right now." <laughs> Maybe I should try I don't that think approach you've got more the guts. often. I don't, no, I don't think you do. But other than encouraging <laughs> folks to uh, help us become rich and famous and popular, popular, of course, that really matters. I want everyone to love me. Be- other than that, what we've been watching this week. Well, what I've been listening to this week is uh, Barry Weiss's latest episode of Honestly, her podcast. And it was one that I put off listening to. If you, if you follow her podcast, you might know this, and you might know why. She has on this week, on her podcast, Nicole Avant. Nicole Avant is the, the daughter of... of uh, Oh, what's the guy's name? Now I forgot his last name. A uh, famous record producer, um, music producer. And and uh, they're an African-American family, a black family, they would say. Brought up when the South was incredibly racist versus now when it's just merely very racist. And she has great stories about her family. Her father, who she learned so much from. Her mother, who she learned so much from. The way that she was brought up, it's incredibly inspiring. The problem was, why didn't I watch it right away or listen to it right away? The way that it's described by Barry Weiss turned me off. It it just made me not want to watch the show. Mm. And it's it's because her guest, Nicole Avant, has just written a book uh, about tragedy forgiveness and thinking free well you would think that's right up our alley we've done whole episodes on trust and forgiveness but listen to this from the description november 30th 2021 when nicole avant got a call in the middle of the night from her husband the unthinkable had happened her otherwise healthy mom jacqueline avant was in critical condition at the hospital she had been shot Nicole would eventually find out that her mother had been having an ordinary evening at her home in Beverly Hills. They were very wealthy by this time. The the story is great. Anyway, her her home in Beverly Hills when a man broke into her home in an attempted robbery. He shot Jacqueline, her mother, and then fled the scene. Her mother died later that night in the hospital. She was 81. It was an unspeakable tragedy that would leave most people paralyzed, enraged, and probably seeking revenge. But Nicole's response surprised a lot of people. She decided that she's not a victim and that she would forgive her mother's murderer. Uh, now, now, some of you who are kindred spirits, who are, who are philosophical allies of ours, will hear that last bit and maybe have the same reaction I did, which is, Forgive her mother's murder. What the hell is that? Turns out you should listen to the episode anyway, despite that one little thing. And when 
after two thirds of these great stories and and great stuff, when they finally turn to that actual aspect of her the interview, that actual story, yes, she did decide to forgive the murderer, but not in any sense whatsoever of moral forgiveness. Mm. Um, there was it was not an evasion. It was just she was going to let go of it. She was going to decide that she was not a victim and that it's not her problem, that she's not going to carry that burden, carry that weight. In other words, it's not as bad as it sounds in the description, and you should definitely listen to that episode of Barry Weiss's podcast. Honestly, it's well, good. Well, it's always good. I mean, usually her, everything that Barry Weiss does is quite good. Yeah, and I was so disappointed when I read that description. Like I said, I put off listening to it all week. But you're right, she's always good. She, Barry well, Weiss I mean, is, is a real... I mean, given her own story, she's a real hero. Yeah, yeah. I really do wish that uh, she, if somebody could help her with um, altruism and parsing concepts of selfishness and altruism out. Um, because, yeah, it doesn't help for her to write her description. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, it not actually be um, moral forgiveness. There's a big, obviously, there, we all know there's a here, we all know here that there is a big disti- distinction between uh, moral forgiveness and um, what you could say is uh, understanding the position of, you know, of, of your loved one's death and then their attacker, their murderer, and in your life and uh, making sure that you're focusing more on values rather than replaying it in your own mind or going out for revenge things like that so we've talked about forgiveness on the show and you should definitely go back and take another listen because i think we do a damn good job on the show you know parsing out concepts and nuances of concepts and contexts in all different ways yeah so Um, there you are yes sorry i'm just catching up in the chat here it's funny that jim ashley says my movie sweethearts and then he gives a list only a couple which I've even actually heard of. Naomi Watts, Bernice Bejo, Bejo, uh, Eleanor Parker, Sylvia Sweeney, Sydney, Sylvia Sydney. See, this tells you that and I don't know all the names. Miranda Otto, Liv Allman, and Grace Kelly. Well, and obviously I know three of those names. Um, but what's interesting, he says, not necessarily in that order. It depends on who I'm in the romantic mood for. It's funny because I advocate making lists. You know what you value. In any given moment, you should be able to call up your, your favorite so maybe I should make a list of, and, you know, I wouldn't want to make it uh, just people I have the hots for. So I'm sure I would say, you know, actors I admire, actresses that I admire and who, you know, inspire me and uh, bring out the best in terms of emotional reactions go. Um, as long as my phone doesn't have a camera, I don't know about, says Jim Ashley. Oh, maybe you've chosen a phone that doesn't have a camera. I have a friend who still uses a flip phone precisely for, <laughs> seriously, for, yes. for privacy reasons. Um, or are you just saying that why. you know what the cameras you do know about are up to? So, yes, yes, let me do more in the chat in a minute. But um, so listening to that Barry Wise podcast, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was charming. It was just nice. And it was good because all week I keep running into skepticism about niceness. Mm. Uh, So much of this. There was a post, for example, on Michael Leibowitz's Facebook page, and he's been doing this lately, kind of morning, real short, quick quips, observations and things, and he wrote, a lot of people are just mean. It's so unnecessary. Now, that's especially charming coming from Michael Leibowitz because, you know, he's written a book, a whole book about the prison system because he spent decades in it. So to have this this gentleman who has uh, come out of the pre, the penal system for a felony, felony assault say, people are just mean and it's so unnecessary. That's, well, that's just charming right there. But of course, I had to agree with him. And my response was, that's the absolute truth. There's so much unpleasantness, and it's just people who are failing to stop the madness. You know, a lot of it is just people who were treated badly, and so they treat people badly. We're big advocates here of stopping the buck. And it's hard. It, it, it can be a work of heroism if you were brought up 
being mistreated. Or if your experience in school was that people treated you badly, to then decide, no, no, the buck stops with me. And I'm not going to carry that forward. I'm not going to be part of a world that mistreats people. I'm going to be one of the forces for good. Mm Mm-hmm. That can be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Or, or the concept of um, treat people as you you deserve to treat them. Ooh, now you're getting <laughs> to the advanced advanced lesson. That's the advanced lesson. <laughs> well, it is. And, well, just because I've gotten in so much trouble for saying that. And uh, it, it takes a moment to explain it. But, yeah, this is... Yeah. There are people who think... I don't think I have many of them in the chat, because I know a lot of the people in the chat. But there are people who think that a certain amount of not just justice but meanness is necessary in the world because of the way the world and people are you know there are people who just think that's that's the way the world is and kindness benevolence manners graciousness is all naivete you know it's a fool's game for suckers and you can either be a you know a sucker or uh, you can be in charge. And that's it. You're either uh, a carny or a mark. Or a giver and a ta- or a taker. Yeah, a yeah. traitor is not on the table. You're a giver or you're a taker. You're a winner or you're a loser. And, that, and those are your only options. You know, life is serious business. You can't go around just smiling and being happy all the time. And being nice... See if this phrase resonates with you. Being nice just gets you used. You know, it, this reminds me of a conversation that Aaron Brooke had uh, recently on his show. Somebody asked him about the movie Whiplash. Yeah. And uh, I, I kind of, I, we saw the we saw the movie once in, in the theaters. We bought the movie. This is a long time ago. <laughs> no. Did we ever get uh, around to cracking open the, no. the Blu-ray and watching it again? <laughs> no. Because I think we We just, should, because we, we really liked the movie, but at the same time... Yeah, the uh, JP dude, um, actor, whatever his name is, that it was the he was a teacher, the instructor. His his methods were wouldn't... I don't think that his methods would actually work in real life. <laughs> I know they wouldn't. Well, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's there's a certain thing where you have a firmness about your teaching style, for instance, and, and, and you know, you don't want to waste any time, and, um, you know, you end up earning the respect of your students, not because you're a horrible person or you're brutal, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, or that you call for sacrifices, you know, it's it's because you are good yourself, and that's admirable, and and that that's that's inspirational. Well, what I want to say about that, yeah, because some people will stumble over this and kind of get stuck, and they won't hear the rest of what you say. It's not true that that doesn't work, or rather, it's not true that you don't get the result you're shooting for by doing that, because people do, and they have, and they've gotten results. The question is, when you take that approach, yeah, you know, the approach of the J.K. Simmons character, right. for example, in Whiplash, do you do more harm than good? Is it worth it? Right. And, you know, two words will make that point. Michael Jackson. Uh, you can push somebody God. so hard that they may well reach an elevated level of ability yeah. beyond what even the most self-motivated person could do. Right. If you are willing to sustain the kind of damage that that also would do. Right. You know, for example, our, our Miles Teller character. In, and fortunately, then the reason, one of the reasons, I don't know, it would be a bit of a spoiler if you haven't seen Whiplash yet. Well, I'll look, say it. Uh, you just know, say it. give me 30 seconds and put it on mute if you haven't seen Whiplash yet. The Miles Teller character in the movie doesn't let that happen. He is enormously self-motivated. He needs, I should have looked it up and got the names of the characters, but uh, the J.K. Simmons character, the teacher, he uses the teacher for everything the teacher can give him, and he needs that because that's going to get him to the next level, but he doesn't let that character break him. And in the end, it ends up being a battle of wits and wills, 
and the Miles Teller, Teller character actually wins in the end. Yes. And that's part of what makes it such a great movie. Yes. Probably what makes it such a great movie. Absolutely. It's not because of the, uh, the, the instructor being so, you know, obnoxious. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we should watch the film. I at least should watch the film again. Yeah, we can watch the film again. We spend too much time together. We don't watch too many movies separately. Although you saw Wonka last night, and I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, yeah. I was too busy watching the Detroit Symphony Orchestra play the music of Pink Floyd. <laughs> and I didn't go because I don't like Pink. I don't like Pink Floyd. <laughs> Amy, for some reason, uh, does she does she doesn't quite understand Pink Floyd. She hasn't, she hasn't figured them out yet. Uh, be gone, evil one. <laughs> No. <laughs> anyway. Yes. There you go. But uh, anyway, we were saying about, um, yeah, the idea of being nice and uh, nice guys finish last. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jim in the chat is saying, what's interesting to me are people who are mean to those whom they supposedly love. What they don't realize or what they evade is the fact that every time they are mean to a friend or a loved one, they damage that relationship with them that much more. If their meanness escalates to violence, well, that creates a new discussion. Right. It's it's absolutely true, and that's why, you know, I said earlier that these are people who were treated badly, and so they treat people badly. Yeah. Uh, there's an expression that people use. It sounds a little too easy, but damaged people damage people. Yes, or hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, speaking of um, Michael Leibowitz's uh, comment about, you know, why are people so mean? It's so unnecessary. And my first reaction was they're mean be- to other people because they're mean to themselves first. Um, that's always the case. Always the case. Especially if you have somebody who is habitually mean and, and nasty. You're going to find that their, their self-talk is not positive. That they're not a good friend to themselves. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, vice does not pay. No. And we, we've talked about before, whether you're talking about uh, fictional characters, uh, The Sopranos, you know, was was uh, Danny Sopranos, what was the lead character's name? Another show I didn't watch. Was he selfish? Was he happy? Did he actually experience joy in his life? Well, there was some. He was rich. He was, he was very successful as a criminal. Does anybody want that state of mind? Uh, the classic real example is Bernie Madoff, who wrote and was interviewed, and as best anybody can tell, he certainly seemed credible. He really believed. He was miserable before he got caught. Yeah. And not just because he knew he was going to get caught someday, but just how can you live your life knowing you're the bad guy? That everybody you meet and smile with and spend time with, you are actually the enemy of that person. And the answer is... If you're treated badly, you treat people badly. You think that's the way the world is. You were brought up that way. You might even sort of kind of think that it's wrong that it's that way, but you believe it is. You believe it is that way. It's not me, you know, there's James Taggart. It's not me who made the world the way it is. <laughs> you know, or, or Robert Stadler making excuses because, you know, if he had designed the world, he would have made it better, but it's not. And you got to do what you got to do, what given can, the way the world is. Yeah, what can you do when you have to deal with people? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Not be a knucklehead. How about that, Robert Stadler? <laughs> right. Gosh. So somebody on the John Galt line, the Facebook group, where they talk about things, and it's a private group, so if you're not already a member or if you're not using Facebook, I'll just tell you, somebody posted a post about a book called Nice Guys Finish Last. And the idea is that this book is going to teach you how not to be a nice guy, how not to finish last, how not, or excuse me, the book is called No More, Mr. Nice Guy. And Mm. sadly, it's not a book about Alice Cooper. (laughs) Right. Uh, No more, Mr. Nice Guy. No, no more, Mr. Nice Guy. A proven plan for getting what you want in love, sex, and life. I mean, you know he's in trouble right there when he separates love and sex. But okay, we'll 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 let that go for now. Well, it's for the GQ audience. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, for that, I can just read Andrew Tate and you know follow his prescriptions for how to be a happy person. He's so obviously a joyous person. Such a winner. <laughs> he's he's got tiger blood, or what? What does Charlie Sheen have again? I forget. 
Oh, uh, who had tiger blood? Somebody will say. Somebody in the chat will <laughs> remind us. Yeah, yeah. Apollo Zeus knows who Vincent Furnier is. That's it. Yeah, also from Detroit. Yeah. Also from Michigan. Yeah, Charlie Sheen, Tiger Blood. The great blood. Alice Cooper. Charlie Sheen was Tiger Blood guy? Yes. Okay. Yes. You know, at some point, you, you reach a certain level where saying those things seems to make sense. <laughs> well, I, I kind of wonder now about the no more Mr. Nice Guy. I mean, it's just sort of, um. I mean, if this is the thing is that we're in a culture right now where, you know, everyone's lambasting. Oh, he's just a white guy. And, uh. Oh, you know, it's just such a, was it a mis misandry? How do you say that again? Uh, anyway, it, you know, the, the opposite of um, misogyny. And yeah, I mean, sure, you know, guys, stand up for yourself. Men, stand yeah. up. Please, please, please stand up for yourself, men. <laughs> right. Please give give me a Hollywood uh, man role model who I might be able to find attractive. <laughs> Because right now, all of them are just so, yeah. so gosh darn it all, um, I don't know, wimpy, I suppose. I don't know. Something yeah. like that. Well, those are your choices. You can be Andrew Tate or you can be a milk toast. Right. If anybody doesn't know the expression milk toast, it's just what it sounds like. You can be the wimp or you can be the tough guy. Those are your choices. Or as John Paquette says in the chat, you can be the dog or you can be the hydrant. <laughs> those are your choices Oof. some people some people cannot reconcile benevolence and what's the ultimate masculine quality assertiveness strength some people can't reconcile that they can't put benevolence style grace manners kindness together with standing up for yourself and the people you care about and it's a shame I mean look at me I'm the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. But for precisely that reason, I'm not going to tolerate jerks. Uh, keep this G-rated. <laughs> Knuckleheads. <sighs> Knuckleheads. Dipwads. <laughs> you know, not standing up for yourself, not standing up for the people you care about, Yeah. being meek when you should be ambitious, you know, being a milk toast when you need to be tough. That's not nice. That's not nice at all. That's not what being nice is. If you've got it in your head that those are your alternatives, they are false alternatives. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have, um, I really do like the word nice. I like the idea of being nice to myself, which means being assertive. So you can, you can frame it that way as well. Yes, yes. Look up, because uh, I didn't put it in the links, a bit of Fry and Lori and their rap song. Oh, uh, good ass mother liker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's the title, but that's the lyric. Uh, but it makes exactly the point. It makes fun of that whole false alternative. Yeah, it's called "Be Nice, Good Ass Mother Liker." <laughs> Yo, <laughs> that's a great. It's a great little song they did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Narendra is trying to get me going here. He says, "Speaking truth makes you bad guy." So. So be badass. I, I, I mean, that's a fun way to put it, and so I could get on board with that, even though it kind of plays with the false alternative. But then he says, cold plus kind, and then Howard Rourke. That is exactly how you know we would think of Howard Rourke in the sense that you know Peter Keating talks to him and says, you know, you, you're the coldest guy, and yet you're you're also the most uh, what does he say, life giving or. Uh, and Rourke has that, but I never think of Rourke as cold. I think Rourke only seems cold to people who are looking for the stereotypical wishy-washy, nice, diplomatic, kind of, you know, sort of not too... No, Rourke is Rourke. Rourke is self-confident, and he's he's got self-possession that puts people off. But he's not cold. He's passionate. Rourke is, Rourke is man, I mean, Rourke gets fired up. But he doesn't get fired up over the goofy stuff that people get fired up over. Yeah. No, if you want to see Rourke get emotional, it's got to be substance. But I will always think of Howard Rourke as the most passionate guy in that whole freaking book. Right. The more, and the more you read it, every time you read it, the, the more fleshed out he becomes. Yeah. Just like when you read Atlas Shrugged, the more fleshed out uh, John uh, becomes. John Galt. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I really do. I mean, he he appears in a few scenes, 
but there's some there's a, a really lovely deductive process Ayn Rand gives you to uh, to exercise um, when reading it and you know when he's talking with Eddie when you know it, it's a, it's it's really really fun piecing him together it's really fun I love it well yeah you're right <laughs> I, I totally get that I do I really do it's just so much easier with Rourke. <laughs> Uh, yes, Greg says, John Galt? Who is John Galt? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, they're yes. giving some great examples in the chat, too, of, of great male actors and characters. And of course, Jeff Bannister mentioned Nicole Kidman. See, there's, there's somebody who, depending on the role, is enormously crush-worthy. So there you go. But yeah, yeah, that whole idea of nice guys finish last. I want to finish last. This will be my point before, because we're kind of running longer than I expected. I thought this would be one of those short shows, mm -hmm. like we ever have mm -hmm. short shows anymore. But nice guys, <laughs> nice guys finish last. Well, the gentlemen out there know a real man does finish last. <laughs> and seriously, yeah, in all the important areas of life, do you really want to finish first? Okay, okay, in a race, in a marathon. Yes, you want to finish first. And in a business competition, you want to finish first. Although all that really matters is you want to finish profitably. It doesn't matter if you're better than the guy next door. The question is, are you bringing in the kind of money you want to be bringing in? Finishing last means finishing the longest, spending the most time. Um, there's somebody I occasionally will eat out with who this, this person ends up finishing their meal in half the time I do. And I always think it's good. It's, just take your time and enjoy it. And life is like that. Do you want to be the first one to finish your life? I want to be the last one to finish my life. Yeah, talk about the, um, what is it, John, yeah, John yeah, Vangelis, right? Yeah, there's a John Vangelis song where, uh, yeah, John sings, you know, we've all got to go anyway. Said we've all got to go anyway. And I wouldn't mind being last in the line. Well, what do you, you know, we were driving down the freeway the other day and this guy in a Dodge Charger, zoom, we're already, uh, don't tell the police, but we're already going a fair amount over the speed limit. And this Charger zooms past us like we're standing like, still. And like, what are you, are you in a hurry to your funeral? Yeah, you gotta or, be early to, the fu to your funeral. You don't want to be late for your own funeral. Jeez. No, I will gladly be the nice guy who finishes last. I will not let my own meanness, my own stresses, my own anxieties shorten this already too short and too precious life of mine. Now, am I equivocating between lasting the longest and coming in last? And I'm not equivocating so much as comparing and contrasting. Think twice about what it means to be nice, to be kind, to be gracious, to be well-mannered, to have style, to be, and this is the Rourke, to be self-possessed. Yes. To be who you are. I mean, to be who you are. You are whoever you are. No, to be who you want to be. Who is in your own self-image. It's why, as Amy mentioned earlier, you deserve. You deserve to treat people not just the way they deserve. No, no, you got to go a step beyond that. Because otherwise, you'll spend your whole life feeling like you're the world's policeman. And you will end right. up, like Ms. Avant in her book, feeling like you need to forgive everybody. Or carry that weight, carry that burden. And there's a third alternative. You deserve to treat people not just the way they deserve, but the way you deserve to treat them. By your standards, not just whatever life threw at you, not just whatever they did. No, you're writing this script. You are the script writer. You decide. And because you are also the star of this movie, you have to live your decisions. Treat people not just as they deserve, but as you deserve to treat them. Yes. You know, be who you are, who you deserve to be. Uh, another way this came up before was uh, Nikos Satirikopoulos on, on Twitter, or X. I think we'll always end up calling it X slash Twitter. Uh, was posting about altruism. Somebody else is calling for altruism. You've got the effective altruism movement out there. Um, Bank, Bankman, uh, Sam Bankman, I was about to say Smith. I'm thinking Robert Smith. Friedman, <laughs> Sam Bankman, Friedman, SBF. 
uh, got in all this trouble, and he was a big, you know, effective altruism guy. And now they're having problems. I'm like, maybe you should question the whole idea of altruism. Because, you know, they conflate altruism and benevolence. Two different things. Altruism, yeah. that's practically your milk toast guy. That's practically your schmoo. My purpose in life is to be eaten, to be consumed. No. No, what I wrote on Twitter was, if the altruism appetizer and the self-sacrifice salad <laughs> and the hedonism and narcissism combination plate, <laughs> if those are the only two choices on the menu, go to a different restaurant. Or just eat at home. <laughs> yeah, well, I could eat at home, except for me, and I think for all of you out there, the whole freaking world is my home. I am the last person who's going to say, the world is corrupt, I'm going to stay at home where the good people are. No, I'm surrounded by good people. They're not exactly what they should be. But, man, the coffee shop's my classic. I love my barista. Oh, do you have a regular? No, I don't have a regular barista. Every barista I meet is my barista. Every waitress I get out there, some are better than others. Every service person at every department store, every sporting, every athlete at every sport event I go to, every musician at every concert, I, these are my people. Because this is my life and this is my world. And I want to eat big chunks of that. Sounds wrong when you start talking about people, but... Or big chunks. Or big chunks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's some quotes from that No More Mr. Nice Guy book. The, the writer, and I criticized him for his title, which was Jumping the Gun. There are other things to criticize him for. He says, my definition of integrity is deciding what feels right and doing it. Uh, now, obviously, That's... he's relying on his emotional mechanism to steer him in the right direction. And your emotions can do that, but they can't do it reliably. No, it's not really a definition they're, either. And... They're not tools of cognition, to steal a phrase. Yeah, it's not, uh, I mean, it's, it's, that's an existentialist viewpoint. No, I prefer Martha Beck's book on integrity. Yeah. And we've done whole episodes on it. You can look those up and listen to them, or we'll just talk about it again another time. But I have a spoiler, spoiler alert. For those of you who are still kind of stuck in the carnies and marks, the, uh, you know, the, the successful thief or the guy who's taken advantage of, if you're still caught in that dichotomy, I've got a spoiler for you. I'm going to tell you how this movie ends. <laughs> Wait, what movie? Your life. The world. Here's the spoiler. In the end, the good guys win. Ooh, wow. <laughs> I, can, I say that because I've already seen the extensive previews, so I already know how it sure. ends. Sure. Uh, trust me on that one. Yeah, well, I got to say it does because I, you know what, guys, I just got to say this past couple of weeks or a couple of few months or whatever, I've, I've been going through um, different challenges at, uh, at my work, which have been meaningful and rewarding. And it's been really good. Um, but there have also been opportunities for me to speak my mind in a way that things I, you know, people have not suspected me to talk about <laughs> so i've been able to ex uh well i've been able to um exercise a lot of courage this couple of weeks this last couple of weeks i'm going to keep extending um and, and applying my courage uh and trusting myself well you've been a downright activist well, not quite. Well, but the thing is, uh, about the good the guys or the nice girls finish first, <laughs> it's absolutely true. Yes. Well, when 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 you establish a relationship with people and you can you people can tell that you're competent, that you're focused, but that you're also benevolent, that you are a value seeker, that you look for values and you call them out. You know, you might compliment people. You know, whatever it may be. Um, if you have a good, solid track record of not just being really good at what you do, but also being benevolent in general towards people and being virtue focused in that way, um, people trust you. It, I know in this world, in this day and age, you can still find people 
uh, who recognize that as good and you can rely on their evaluation of you. Um, you don't have to, of course. You go in, you don't really know. But uh, I'm finding more and more that that is that this pays off. That uh, being virtuous pays off, tr- seriously, in big ways. And uh, you don't have to be, you know, surrounded by objectivists to to see this and to have these relationships and to be able to reach out and make connections in meaningful and value-oriented ways and rational ways. So I'm just going to say that. It's been You're You're reminding cool. us that, that <laughs> being tough and being nice are not mutually exclusive because you have yeah. been super tough. Yeah. You've been kind of, you know, even a certain amount of risk tolerance going on there in some of the things you've done lately. <laughs> and at the same time, you're still the nicest person you'd ever want to meet. Yes. And that's exactly as it should be. Last week, I uh, remember in the chat, it was brought up uh, something not necessarily flattering about uh, Chrissy Hind and Joan Jett. And you can add Cindy Lauper and, and certain kinds of stars, over, since we're talking about women, who are both tough and yet the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. You know, watch interviews with them. And it's, uh, yeah. I want, to, I want to meet Cindy Lop. Well, we met her briefly once, but I want to really meet her. I could spend time with somebody like that. Uh, I could spend, spend time with Joan with Jett. I, I want to go you know, play guitar with Chrissy Hyde. I want, these are people I'd actually want to hang out with. Yes. Because they're tough as hell, but they're also the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. And you can do that. You know, like you were saying, if your virtues don't work, <laughs> if, you're, if you think that honesty, that integrity, if these are suckers games... If you think that being productive while, you know, other people scam, if you think that exerting justice, treating people the way that they deserve, if you think these things don't work, you, you, well, you got to you got to change your philosophy because yeah. if your 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 owner's manual for life, your philosophical system doesn't work, that's the wrong philosophy. It's not true. If you have the right philosophy of life, then even if other people live by other philosophies, and therefore sometimes you have to pay the price for your honesty, sometimes being just doesn't appear to work, then you're still okay. Your owner's manual is telling you the right stuff. It's telling you the way your vehicle works. And, you know, yeah, there's other people out there, and they might occasionally crash into you. Well, you know, i got to say that I'm learning more and more in life that um, for people who take the route of cynicism or convince themselves that, you know, good, good guys finish last or whatever, um, they often don't have the life experience to test this. (laughs) And so it takes courage to get life experience. It takes courage to go out there and uh, deal with people and uh, you know you, you may fail whatever but keep persevering and knowing that if you persevere then you will get what you want um, if you will find the right people whatever it takes you know Howard Rourke fo- found Roger and Wright or vice versa you know pe- people found him because of his reputation yeah and uh, that's true find your allies find your Mike your red find your Kent Lansing find your allies yeah, but but it's 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 more to more than that. Just it, you know, success doesn't fall on your lap. You you have to actually work at it. And uh, I've been finding that I'm working at it quite a lot lately, <laughs> which is which is very very good. And I I'm very happy. So um, yeah. Yeah, I have one more thing. Do I want to say it? Let me see if I can say this in 60 seconds or less. You're going to occasionally run into people objectivism wouldn't work for, or rational philosophy, Aristotelianism wouldn't work for. What do I mean by that? I mean, there are some people out there who are so damaged that even if they've achieved great success in their lives, and they're somewhat happy, they won't be made happier by changing their entire life philosophy. For some people, it's just too late. You couldn't take, we mentioned Rush Limbaugh last week, you couldn't take Rush Limbaugh a year before his deathbed, get him to change his entire philosophy and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is making me even happier. Because of all the reasons he believes what he believes. And my point in mentioning this is you're going to see that it's not, when you see that, it's not a counterexample to the fact that virtue does achieve, does produce happiness, does produce success, uh, does result in self-esteem. 
Don't let that throw you. Occasionally, you'll see the criminal out there who does appear successful, or at least wouldn't be any more happy if he could turn it around and become virtuous. It's just too late for him. Now, there are counterexamples. There are people who make extreme changes, and they're rare. Only reason I bring it up is don't let that throw you. I've known people like that, and I thought, you know, it's sad that I could never convince him to become virtuous, even though I know he would be happier. I couldn't convince him that he would be happier. Right becoming virtuous. So don't let that throw you. But with that said, nice guys finish last. And finishing last is one of the best things in the world. Oh, uh, Jim Ashley says, reminder, Love Letters. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Love Letters is appearing on Turner Classic Movies TCM tonight at 9.45 p.m. Eastern and 6.45 p.m. Pacific. Excellent. Um, We actually already have this on DVD, so thank you. We could watch it anytime we want. Anybody who hasn't seen Love Letters by Ayn Rand, 1945, uh, a winner. Definitely worth seeing. And it's it was based on a book. She didn't write the screenplay from scratch. But the dialogue is so obviously written by Ayn Rand. And the point made in the film, uh, yeah, it's it's sort of a combination. Well, I, w- I won't give away any, any uh, spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> Other than I love a good Cyrano story. But, yes, yes, definitely do watch that. My post-it note for the week. And I'm going to put this one up. I put up a post-it note every week to remind myself of things, often things I already know, but that need, I need to take action on. Um, has nothing to do with today's topic, but here's what it says. Decrease your options. And there, there's some fine print on the bottom, too. So that only what matters is on the menu. I was listening to um, one of those inspirational speeches out there. This one was by the actor, Matthew McGonaghy. And he made the point that if you've got a lot of distractions, even if you've got a lot of good options, but you've got too many and they're keeping you from what it is you really want, you've got to decrease your options. You've got, and, and it immediately made me think of the musician Jack White. Right. Jack White, when he was in the band The White Stripes, would intentionally limit himself. He limited himself, for example, to all analog equipment. He would record to tape. He would use older or really quirky guitars and really basic equipment. And he said it it made me more creative to get all of the, the extra stuff out of the way and limit myself to just these few options. You know, and I gotta say, that's something I've been ta- I've been thinking about in my head recently is that uh, I keep thinking to myself, Amy, Use your imagination. Use your imagination. <laughs> Use your imagination. Don't just um, go on autopilot or run a script or, or anything like that. Use your imagination. So, and and there's a lot of things that I'm trying to apply this to my life. Um, just like Jack White tried to just you know decrease his options. That does take imagination. Yes, it mm-hmm. takes a lot of. Um, you know, asking yourself, wait a minute, does it really need to be this way? Do I really need to do it this way? Is this some? Is there a way to cut this corner? Is there a way to go at this in a different perspective? Um, how can I better organize this? How can, you know, all that. I mean, yeah, just keep asking yourself questions. Use your imagination and uh, make it work for you. And, you know, we, and we also talked about um, the, the concept of spending out. You know, use your use up your resources. Use those resources. Don't you know squirrel them away for another day. Use them now. Um, make them beneficial to you. You're going to get more, so don't worry about using them up. Um, yeah. And, Tomorrow and- is a day that never comes. <laughs> the only thing worth putting away for a rainy day is cash. Other than that. If you've got stuff that you've been saving for just the right occasion, but that occasion doesn't seem to be coming up, make an occasion or don't wait for an occasion. But yeah, the reason I've been thinking decrease your options too is because I'm overdue to reread James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. And uh, I'll probably, you know, I've done whole shows on this book, but I'll probably have some insights to share going through it again because some of my habits have gone by the wayside and I need to once again decrease my options get the distractions and and the less healthy alternatives out of the way out of uh, the realm of possibility decrease my options if you find yourself with that same challenge consider putting up a post-it note this week that says decrease your options think about how you can get yourself to where the things you really want are the only things on the menu 
that's what I'll be working on. Folks, thanks for joining us for an especially long episode. I do appreciate seeing everybody in the chat and uh, hearing from you later after the show. If you're catching this one later on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all of the places that you may or may not be listening. Thank you for joining us. I hope yes, you all have an outstanding you. week. I want to give a special thank you, a huge shout out to those of you who are our patrons. Yes, we have a Patreon and we do get some love from you every month and that makes all the difference. So thank you to those of you who continue to support the show. If you want to join those most awesome people. Yeah, don't, to, don't be a chicken. Don't be a chicken. Don't be a chicken. I know you're afraid of Patreon, but but that's just chicken and you shouldn't do... No, we won't. Why don't you prove me wrong? <laughs> The reverse psychology on our support. <laughs> but seriously, folks, if you go to robertnacer.com, spelled like my name, robertnacer.com, on that page near the bottom, but maybe it should be at the very top, you will see links to both Patreon and PayPal, where you can give a one-time little tip, tip jar. Uh, very easy if you've got either Patreon or PayPal set up. And easy to set up if you don't. And with that said, that's it. I'm going to wrap because we're running long. Thank you for joining us. We wish you every success that you so richly deserve. How do I know you deserve success? Because you're beautiful. But also because you wouldn't listen to a show like this if you were not interested in living a virtuous, value-laden, value-oriented life. I know you are. Thank you for being kindred spirits of that. And that's also why we wish you love.